That's right. <clears throat> Thank you and hello everyone. Uh, my title indeed is Observational Properties Very Weakly Coupled Dark Matter, by which I mean scenarios where dark matter is very weakly coupled to the standard model of particle physics, or perhaps not at all. And the talk is based on uh, two written articles by me and my collaborators, because I only have 15 minutes. I'm not going into very details of them, but I will give you a brief overview of the results and um, scenarios we studied in general in those papers. So to start with, there's a great deal of evidence for the existence of dark matter. We all know that there are rotational velocity curves of galaxies, bullet cluster-like objects, acoustic peaks in the cosmic microwave background radiation spectrum, and so on and so forth. Yet the nature, the very nature of dark matter is unknown. And we have to ask, what is dark matter? What is the correct explanation for this invisible matter content observed in the universe? Does the dark matter particle exist? Or are there perhaps many dark matter particles? And if so, what are they? Are they wimps, spimps, simps, skimps, spitmins, wisps, alps, wimps, silas, terang, neutrinos, or perhaps primordial black holes? We do not know. Or should gravity be modified? That's also a question one can ask. It's certainly an option, although somewhat less likely, I'd say. In any case, the very question is, how can we tell which model is the correct one, if any of these? We do not know what dark matter is, but that's not due to the lack of experimental try. There are many ongoing experiments. One can try to produce dark matter colliders, there are direct detection and indirect detection, or as it can also be put, make it, shake it, break it. But still, because given that we haven't found wings, we haven't found what dark matter is, one has to ask, what if dark matter interacts only feebly with the known particles? Or not at all. What do we do then? Is all hope lost in saying what dark matter is and testing its properties? Or are there still something we can do, some models we can probe, and some production mechanisms how dark matter may have been produced in the early universe? And let me now discuss such a scenario where dark matter interacts only very feebly with the known standard model particles. And let me present you a very simple model, very simple extension of the standard model, just to give you an example. In this model, where I have a decoupled hidden sector, in the simplest case, the scalar sector of the model is specified by the following potential, where on top of the usual standard model Higgs field mass term and its quartic self-interaction term, I have similar terms for this new dark matter particle, which I assume to be a real singlet scalar in this simplest case. And uh, it has not only a mass term and a quartic self-interaction term, but also coupling to the standard model Higgs doublet, by this so-called Higgs portal coupling. So this is one of those so-called Higgs portal models, where uh, there's the standard model sector, and then an unknown hidden sector, which may or may not be rather strongly coupled to the standard model sector, or perhaps very weakly, even feebly. Uh, and of course, this is just the simplest model. On top of the standard model, there can be a hidden sector where there's even more structure. One can entertain a thought that there are perhaps there are neutrinos in the hidden sector. You can introduce singlet fermions and couple them to this real singlet scalar field. Or you can promote this S field to be a complex doublet of a hidden SU2 symmetry, and so on and so forth. And uh, in this kind of models, either the scalar S, the fermion psi, or a vector A associated to this hidden SU2 symmetry, or many of them simultaneously, can play the role of dark matter. But if this hidden sector was only very, very weakly coupled to the standard model sector, there are two obvious questions which are how was dark matter produced in the early universe and how can these kind of models be tested. And let me now present you an alternative to this usual freeze out of dark matter. Let me discuss dark matter production mechanisms because there are basically two mechanisms, two simple mechanisms for dark matter production. They are called freeze out and freeze in of dark matter. You may be aware of freeze out. That's the usual scenario. That's the textbook case. 
that's the case where dark matter interact, uh, interacts relatively strongly with the standard model particles so that dark matter particles were in thermal equilibrium with the standard model particles in the early universe. You may be familiar with this, but let me walk you through these figures anyway. X-axis is the dark matter mass over temperature, and because in an expanding universe, temperature is decreasing, M over T is increasing, so X-axis is basically time, whereas Y-axis in both panels is dark matter number density, essentially. And in this case of free result, the number density of dark matter first followed this black solid line, the equilibrium curve, until at some point, uh, the interaction rate between the standard model particles and dark matter was not large enough to compete against the expansion of the universe anymore and the dark matter particles <coughs> froze out from this equilibrium curve. That's the usual case. That's the case where dark matter is a thermal relic. That's the wind case. But it might so happen that dark matter just interacts so weakly with the standard model particles that it was never in thermal equilibrium with the standard model particles in the early universe. If that was the case, then dark matter cannot be produced by this free self mechanism because it just wasn't in thermal equilibrium in the beginning. However, it can be produced by gradual decays and annihilations of standard model particles into dark matter. And for instance, in this simplest kind of model that I presented first, this coupling, this photon coupling, allows Higgs bosons to decay into these singlet scalar particles after the Higgs field has gained a vacuum expectation value around the electronic scale. Uh, and then uh, this Higgs boson decay into dark matter particles can go on for some time until the number density of Higgs bosons becomes Boltzmann suppressed and the universe basically runs out of Higgs bosons. That's how dark matter can freeze in to the observed value that we see today. So this is uh, a recently proposed alternative to this freeze-out scenario and uh, studied to some extent but uh, uh, not exhaustively uh, thus far. Basically just to repeat what I just said, uh, the freeze-out is the scenario where dark matter was initially in thermal equilibrium with the standard model particles and this requires rather strong coupling. The portal coupling has to be order 0.1 or so. It's a weak scale coupling, yes, but it's indeed a rather strong coupling compared to the ones I'm going to talk about next. The scenario is particularly appealing because it may lead to a VIMP miracle. That's the case where dark matter is a thermal relic with a weak scale cross section and a mass of the order electronic scale. And because that can be calculated to give you uh, roughly the correct relic abundance that has been called be a miracle. However, that kind of scenarios start to be rather constrained by experiments. We haven't found wins. So one must consider some alternatives to that. And first, one can consider such frozen in dark matter that I just discussed. First of all, this requires very small couplings. Otherwise, such hidden singlet sectors thermalized with the standard model. This is, by the way, sometimes called the FIMP scenario. Not the FIMP scenario, but the FIMP scenario for feebly interacting massive particles. And of course, because of this very small coupling, these kind of scenarios cannot usually be tested by collider experiments. But the thing is that they can still be tested by cosmological and astrophysical observations. These include indirect detection signals, astrophysical imprints, of self-interacting or non-thermal dark matter, imprints of dark matter on the cosmic microwave background radiation, and so on. So it's very difficult, but not impossible to test these kind of models. Uh, and unfortunately, I do not have time to go into details, but if you are interested in them, you can take a look on a recent review paper by me and my collaborators, which we named the Dawn of Pink Dark Matter, and where we reviewed all, hopefully all models and all constraints. Uh, that have been presented in the literature uh, thus far. So that's the FIMP scenario. That's the case where dark matter <coughs> consists of particles and which just happen to interact very weakly with the standard model particles. But of course, it 
may be that dark matter does not consist of new elementary particles, but it can consist of, now comes the magic word, primordial black holes. <laughs> Some people say it's a crazy idea, and people ask, that, do I believe in primordial black holes? And the thing is that, of course I don't. I believe in nothing. I think that it's, it's an interesting playground, and because there are, there are many well-motivated scenarios how primordial black holes can have formed in the early universe. For instance, they can form from sufficiently large density perturbations which got greatly enhanced during an early matter-dominated phase. And one does not need, for instance, features in inflationary potential or inflationary power spectrum to produce them. So I think it's not that crazy an idea. Uh, maybe somewhat, but not too crazy. In any case, uh, it's a scenario worth testing. And, of course, primordial black holes are interesting from the point of view of LIGO observation of black hole mergers around 10 solar masses or so. So I've studied this as well in these two papers that we put out recently. And uh, there we studied both uh, well-motivated scenarios for how primordial black holes can form in the early universe and, more importantly, constraints on such scenario. And this is what we found. Unfortunately, colors are, are not uh, easy to see, but uh, in all panels here, x-axis is the peak mass of your primordial black hole mass distribution. And y-axis in all panels is the fraction of uh, fraction of dark matter that is in primordial black holes. The, uh, uh, the top of this or all these panels is one that's where dark, primordial black holes can explain all dark matter. Usually people uh, give constraints on monochromatic mass functions which means that primordial black holes I mean, this refers to a scenario where primordial black holes have formed at one particular mass scale only. But in reality, uh, you may ex might expect that to be not the case, but that primordial black holes form at uh, many different masses, so that there's a range of masses and the mass function is extended. And then, depending on the form, on the exact form of that mass function, uh, the constraints evolve a little bit. Uh, in that paper, we presented a method how to adapt the constraints for monochromatic mass functions to any types of extended mass functions, whether it was of log normal form or of power law form of different types, and so on. But of course, uh, because we are interested in dark matter, uh, we uh, wanted to see that are there any types of mass functions uh, which would allow primordial black holes to constitute all observed dark matter abundance. And it really depends on how do you take these different constraints on primordial black holes. Some of them are more robust, especially those coming from microlensing or uh, observations of the CMB, because primordial black holes can distort that, so observations of CMB give constraints on uh, primordial black holes, but then there are constraints which depend on additional assumptions of the underlying astrophysics. And the thing is that if you take all the constraints at their face value, there exist no regions where primordial black holes could constitute all dark matter. This is what is shown here for log normal mass function. X-axis is again in all panels um, the uh, peak mass and y-axis in all panels is the width of the mass function. Whereas the color coding shows a uh, fraction of dark matter. The darker the color, the more primordial black holes can explain of the observed dark matter abundance. So this is where all constraints are taken into account and indeed we found that nowhere primordial black holes can give you the uh, observed dark matter abundance. But if you are willing to uh, neglect some constraints, uh, if you are 
willing to tweak them a little bit, let's say, then you find that there are three windows where exactly do they lie, depends on your mass function, but where primordial black holes can still constitute all dark matter. More, most importantly, one of them lies at 10 solar masses, around 10 solar masses, which, as said, is interesting from the LIGO point of view. The other two are around 10 to minus 14 <coughs> and 10 to minus 16 solar masses. So this is what we studied in that paper. And uh, because I'm already running out of my time soon, let me come to my conclusions. First of all, the nature of dark matter is still unknown. Hopefully you were not expecting anything else from this talk. Uh, but as said, weakly coupled hidden sectors contain many interesting features which have not been studied extensively thus far. And I think that there's still avenue uh, to do something new. Also, I'd say that primordial black holes are a compelling alternative to particle dark matter and <coughs> may constitute all dark matter. But whether, they, whether or not they do depends on those additional astrophysical assumptions and they should be studied in more detail in the future. But the bottom line, in any case, is cosmological and astrophysical observations provide a valuable resource on testing different dark matter models. That's it. Thank you.